Hello and welcome back to this very special episode of our special podcast, which is coming to you live from the Financial Planning Association Congress. Danny and I are very, very proud to bring to you two special guests, and I'm going to let you introduce them, Danny. Very special guests. We've entered lunch, so that's when, you know, people have got enough energy to have the really important conversations. So we've got a name that is well known within financial services, Michelle Levy joining us and of, and also Sarah, the CEO of the FPA. So thanks for joining us. This is going to be a really nice opportunity to get to the heart of a lot of work that you've been headlining, Michelle. And really, first, we would love to understand because I've, I've heard you present at a number of conferences like the FPA Congress. And so we would love to understand... You know, what were the things in your review after you delivered your first, you know, your proposals. first proposal, yeah, um, that you you were surprised and, and how they were received? Like, what were the things that made you um, a little bit, yeah, what caught you unaware? I think the some of the things that we've been talking about at the conference today, in fact, was really the fear, I think it's fear around um, among financial advisors that I suppose unscrupulous or poor um, providers of advice will be let back into the industry. Um, I don't think that's right and um, but I was I I think surprised that um, that was a real genuine fear which I need to really work hard to try to um, give confidence that you know that isn't what will happen. But is it, now, I wanted to ask you a question um, uh, uh, around this process because this is a huge undertaking and I could not imagine how you would even start this process. And so I want to I go back a little bit from the beginning and go, how did you even start this process? Like, where did you start? What, what, what were your thoughts around the, the, the profession itself? Um, do you have a financial? Have you been through the experience? And, and, and all those sorts of things. Um, from the, from the get-go when you were asked to do this, to take on this mammoth task, where, where did you start? Don't say mammoth. Um, I've started this 20-odd years. No, more. T- I, my first financial advisor was 25 years ago, and I won't tell you what I invested in, but it was a good lesson. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it's not a mammoth task. It's an important task. Um, there are loads of people to talk to and hear about, but it's actually a discrete piece of law that applies to a very large industry. So my job is to look at the regulatory framework and how that affects how the industry operates and what can be changed. So that of itself is, it's big, but it's kind of discreet and I felt confident that I understood it really well. Um, And I do understand it really well, so I know what I'm dealing with. Um, I suppose I didn't know that it would be so passionately felt by people and then me I've kind of become really attached to it as well so tell me about that transformation for you you mentioned that it's so so deep and personal for you now tell tell us about that transformation in your from being a a a task and a job and a a discrete set of law to being something you're so passionate about um well it started you know I was I am a lawyer who kind of gives in the main fairly dispassionate advice to my clients and so it was a bit of a academics wrong because you want to help your clients but it was a bit more you know at arm's length I think and then I started it and I sort of saw it in that way initially but then I started talking to people and I thought wow this is you know you know it shouldn't be a surprise I'm you know fairly uh, passionate about my own profession but this is their livelihoods and they you know, feel it and live it. And then I thought about how it's affecting the people I know, my own children. And so that also um, became sort of like a personal project. How do I help my children? They're really in my mind all the time. Yeah, now this sounds exactly like the many of the stories I've interviewed advisors on of how they fell into financial advice. So we might get you to be a financial planner yet. Uh, Sarah, thank you for, for joining us as well as part That's of this great. conversation. Uh, t- talk to us a little bit about your process at the beginning, from the beginning of this process and how uh, you and the association has been involved. Well, I think it was clear right from the start that this was a really critical review for our profession. So we, we put resources on it very, very quickly. But the other 
thing that we wanted to do was really identify where people are agreeing in, in our profession and I think sometimes there's a perception that we disagree or, or that you know there's lots of differences of views but I've been struck by how many uh, views are actually consistently held by a wide range of different people and Michelle you used the analogy on stage um, earlier today that you haven't heard anyone defend the fee disclosure statement um, that there are lots of areas like that where everyone's in heated agreement it's kind of a captain obvious that we need to do x or not do y so ourselves with 12 other associations have been working together to try to identify those areas where there is strong agreement and make sure that it's known that that we all agree on x whatever x might be um, and ensure that those things where we do agree and we're, we're solidly behind a particular change or reform can be exposed and, and known by um, government reviewers and so on. Yeah. Now, tell us a little bit about the session because you've just come, come off stage. T- tell us about how that went. What uh, obviously that you know there was a lot of questions, and we might get to some of those questions too because they're on the event app that we can get to. Uh, tell us a little bit about the presentation. What you think were some of the key takeaways? Yeah. Look, I think it's really clear that of, of the first round of proposals that that Michelle and her team have made, the proposal for product issue was to be able to offer some form of simple advice. To their, to their customers and not charge for it um, so that that's perceived to be not like the personal advice that a personal financial planner would, would provide. That's the one that for us has generated the most debate, the most concern amongst our members and we did spend a fair bit of time on that today. So in those things that everyone agrees on that we're trying to highlight, has that changed over the course of the discussion? So those things morphed and evolved or... I'm just reflecting on all the yeah, conversations. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of conversations. Because, like, you know, we've had sessions with, with Michelle and, and her team from Treasury. We've had sessions amongst ourselves, sessions with members. And I, and I don't think that people so much changed their minds or changed their positions along the way. I think it's as we came across issues, we'd come together and say, well, what do we think about this? And, and almost use it as a brainstorming session to say, well... Do, do, are we concerned about the outcome or are we concerned about the underlying principle? Are there ways that this proposal could be perhaps finessed or tweaked a little bit so that the concerns that we have could be, you know, done away with or, or at least let us go, you know what, overall we like the proposals. Can we just fine-tune this little bit over here in order to give us greater confidence that it's going to be a net positive change for ourselves and for consumers? So that's where most of the debate's been and where a lot of the discussion has been is, well, what are those tweaks? Yeah. Someone might think this is a better idea. What about that idea? And there's a lot of discussion. What's the biggest level. misconception? Oh, sorry, you go, Michelle. I was just going to say, I think one of the things that people do agree on is in the almost universally, um, people uh, accept that financial institutions, product issuers, this is, have to give some form of advice to their customers. I don't think that your members are concerned with that as a proposition. They are, as you say, there's concerns about how and about what, but I think there is an understanding that... It fills a big, advo- it fills a big gap. Yes. Yeah, so I've, I've had this conversation with a few people around the concept of how do we get financial products which often help people, to be fair, in, in most cases. They might not be sophisticated, but they're, they're, they're financial products. In many cases, help people. Um, and there was a bit of a bottleneck of getting those products to consumers um, and some of the suggestions around what you've put in place. I always like to liken this profession to uh, the medical profession. And I say there are chemists and chemists prescribe the products that uh, doctors prescribe. Uh, but then there's also over-the-counter products, which aren't as strong. And then there is vitamins as well available from the chemists. And there are other products. How much of this uh, proposal, obviously your proposal is very much around the, the personal advice piece of this, um, but, but how much do we bring into the concept of product providers providing product that are advised products and then non-advised products? Um, I think there's a really big difference, actually. And this is something that I've talked about a lot. Uh, this goes to this thing about vertical integration, It doesn't make sense not to have vertical integration in the world of financial products because um, the doctor and the chemist are both selling or recommending, whichever word you want, um, drugs... Prescribing. Prescribing (laughs) drugs issued and manufactured by somebody else. And that isn't what happens. So we use the word product 
to describe a financial product, which is a weird thing because you can't pick it up. They're not a good. They're um, a legal relationship. And so legal relationships don't exist without a, um, a relationship and without a conversation. It might be, it might be online or it might be in writing. But it's, there's an interaction and that interaction will invariably include advice. So those people who don't like the idea of vertical integration, I say, well, what do you think is going to happen? How am I going to... I'm not going to go and pick up my bank account from the chemist. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, Sorry. So, so I was you know, attacking your analogy. I didn't mean to. Uh, that, that's good. That's good. <laughs> healthy, healthy conversation. We had another take on it, interestingly, because one of the paths we went down as a group was, well, should we use an analogy from another profession? And the idea of, well, is cryptocurrency a Schedule 8 drug? for example, whereas is like a, a vanilla, non-geared Australian equity share fund ETF, is that a box of Panadol that I could get from the supermarket shop? And we did go quite a long way having that discussion, but I think at the end of the day, the other challenge for us is we know that not everything we do is financial product advice, but that's Michelle's remit. So, we, you know, we had a lot of discussions about whether, the, you know, there should be a Financial Advice Act. We should recognise that advice about aged care, about Centrelink and so on, is, is part of an advisor's remit and is currently not regulated in the same way. But the reality is that's not in the remit of this particular review. So we had to really focus quite narrowly on what is the opportunity with this review, what are these? What are the ideas that are going to work and make our profession better from this review. Yep. Now, after you release the first draft... Proposals paper. Proposal. Proposals paper. I better get my terminology correct. We'll get it right by the end of this podcast, <laughs> I'm, Michelle. I'm not, I'm not good for terminology <laughs> details, by the way. Um, t- t- tell us about uh, that, that after. Did, were you surprised at what happened after there, or were you expecting a, a quite a strong debate? Oh, I think we were expecting it because we'd already met with people. So I knew that by this stage I'd worked out that people were pretty passionate about their topic and their profession and their interests. So... Um, yeah, no, no, I, I was expecting it. We'd all, you know, set up lots of meetings and roundtables and we did have a... This is where Treasury has been really helpful. Great. They've, you know, we had always anticipated from the very beginning that we would do lots of consultation. I think the proposals paper, uh, I think, was a suggestion that somebody gave me early on and I'm very grateful for that suggestion because it was really helpful to... It's allowed me to find the problems and the issues that I need to address and the areas that I'm changing. So with all those submissions that you've received, and I know the second round of submissions are now closed, what were the, were there a couple of things where there were significant insights that have sort of shifted a perception for you or a view for you? Are there are a few that you can talk about that there that sort of come to the top? I know there's probably lots of nuances, but from those submissions were there... A few things that you said, well, I hadn't considered that from that angle. It was actually quite hard because there were no, there was more division perhaps than I thought there might have been. Um, it's the same concern that Sarah referred to that a lot of advisors are worried about people other than advisors giving advice, but they didn't address that all in the same way. So they had, so that made it really hard then to say, well, there's not a single idea out there and without going to the, the content, if I adjusted X, then that would make a whole lot of other people unhappy. So these things all work together and as soon as you shift one little bit, there's a whole lot of other people over there who'll be unhappy. So what I walked away from, in fact, feeling was it was my job to persuade much more than change because the package, I think, most of all, it's good for consumers, which is my job, but it's actually good for advisors as well. So even though it's not perfect for them, it may not be their absolute wish list, it ultimately is good for them. But if I was to just say, well, let's draw a wall around this, and one of the proposals is that there should be, should be subjects to your earlier suggestion that non-financial advisors should be able to give advice on, then there'll be a whole bunch of other people who will say, well, actually, those are the wrong subjects and that's really hard or they'll be upset, you know. So 
that was the difficult. That is the difficulty, I think. So a whole lot of voices, not necessarily uniform. Mm. Do you have a comment on that, Sarah? From the pe- from the voices that you hear from you know various associations in your collective work, what what would your comment? Yes, be on that? I, w- I mean I think that's fair. There are areas where we agree. There are areas where we don't agree. Um, and one of the challenges we've faced through this particular review is the time to reconcile those viewpoints. So getting 12 associations together, saying, so what do we reckon about X? Uh, exploring what the, what the views are and then exploring the solutions. It takes time to do effectively. And sometimes we haven't had enough time to get all of the groups together. So there are a few occasions where we might have submitted jointly with one other association or three other associations. So whenever we have got to the end point with a group, we reflect that. But that's an area where we would have loved to have had more time because I think if we'd had that, we probably could have given a more coherent, consistent answer. But I I don't take it as um, necessarily a done deal because when Michelle presents the the final paper to the minister, I think there will probably be more conversations. So we're certainly not going to stop and you know all, all take our bat and ball and go home on the 17th of December. We'll be continuing to work on this and continuing to advocate for and put forward the solutions that we think will help. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and and what just one of the questions that's come up on the on the on the chat that within the room, but also something that I've um, always been interested in is around the concept of general advice and the definitions and all those things. We talk about product advice, but um, you know, exp- you know, having all those different clear definitions of from a consumer's point of view, I guess is the is the is the point there because we can come up with all these terms uh, as because we know the legislation, um, but consumers, it's that consumer facing isn't it is trying to work out if they understand what the difference between personal and, and yeah they don't they don't which is why i want to get rid of it i don't want people to it's one of the reasons i was quite keen to get rid of general advice out of the whole regime so my proposal is that what is now covered defined as personal advice which is advice that considers the client's personal circumstances would be broadened and that's so that to assist quality by requiring the provider of advice to take into account their client's circumstances in a broader range of cases than they do now. But that isn't a term that needs to be consumer-facing. General advice needs to disappear from our vocabulary, in my view. Um, Financial product advice is also something that could disappear from our vocabulary, and that's why I haven't spent much time worrying about labels. I say don't make them consumer-facing. They serve a purpose in the act, but that's it. I love the term professional advice, by the way, just to hint, just to <laughs> throw that one in there. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming in and chatting with us today. I really appreciate your time and effort, uh, and, and, and obviously it's been a pretty busy uh, Congress. I'm gonna, Sarah, I'm going to ask you a couple of things about the Congress. H- how's it been? You've obviously been pretty involved. Yeah, look, it, it's fantastic to see it coming to life. You know, th- this particular one's been a very long time in the making, because of COVID, it, yep. it's been three years since we got together. This particular one was postponed twice. So to actually be here and see it and have such a great show up, right? We've got 1,200 people here. You know, it's, it's just fantastic to feel like we're back. Yes. And face-to-face is back and it's great to see everyone. Yes, the hustle and bustle is certainly uh, that as everyone walks yeah. in to have their lunch. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. We really appreciate your time and, and coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Fraser. Thanks, Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Sarah. Hello and welcome back to this incredible podcast uh, series that we are making from live from the Financial Planning Association. Mini series. Mini right? series. And I want to say live, but it's kind of obviously when you're listening to this, it's not in, in the moment, but you know, we're recording it and we're having a great time. Danny, thank you for joining me again. Thanks, Fraser. And we've got a familiar face joining us, someone who is no stranger to the XY community and also the FPEA community. Welcome, Corey. Thank you, Danny. I can hear you well, but I just can't see you through these ferns. Because we are well placed be- ferns. Yes, we are between one fern. <laughs> we certainly are. We are between one fern. There'll be someone out there that gets that joke phrase. I'm, and I'm one pretty person. sure we've got the copyright on be- between one fern. Full mm. disclosure: I'm pretty sure before we went on air, I was the first one that picked up on. I've the been dropping jokes fern. all morning. No one's got it, but thank you. We do. I've now had a win. Like thank it. you. For those that like can't it. see, we have an amazing fern, but it's only one. Uh, so we're definitely not between two ferns because that would has already been taken. Yeah. <laughs> now to the matter at hand. Yeah. Corey, you are well known, but there might not be people who know your story. Mm. Before we get to your session that you were part of a panel today, 
which has quite a bold title. Before we get to that, can you give people the highlight reel of what your business does, how you got into advice and what your business looks like today? Sure. I'll give you a very condensed yeah. version. So I got into financial planning in 2011. That was off the back of doing marketing and PR at uni, but started investing when I was about 16, had a margin loan at 17, always thought that making good choices with money was integral to living a great life. Right? So I was always keen to build independence and freedom financially early in my own life and um, decided um, to get into financial planning thinking that the role of the advisor is to help people make great choices, to set goals, to work out what stresses they've got that's wholly or partially caused by their finances and really coach people, guide people and help them you know, get more out of their life. And got into financial planning on that basis and um, my uh, first role in advice was an associate advisor at one of the, the big four banks and that was probably the tail end of the, the, the bad old days, you know, my fingers are doing the quotation marks there and, um, you know, the advice was very different to what I anticipated it would be, the role the advisor was playing was very different to what I anticipated it would be and from my perspective, that's a shame because I feel like um, when advice is done well and it's personalised um, and it's done without some of the traditional conflicts, um, it can be really impactful. And for the right client at the right time, it can actually be life-changing as well. So on that basis, with that intent, I wanted to start a firm, which ended up being Verse, which we started in 2015. And we kind of had a two-step goal in mind, which was really take this traditional low value to a degree, two-dimensional financial planning experience and make it something that is more holistic, um, more purposeful, more personal, more valuable and try and do it without the traditional conflicts and so on. And, and then once we figure out how to do that bit, which took a while, um, then try and figure out how to scale it. Um, in terms of where we're up to now, we've, we've kind of solved problem one to a very large degree. Like we're always trying to get better and deliver more value, but we've got a lot of things right over time there by getting a lot of things wrong, I guess. If that yeah. makes sense? Well, we'll dive into that later. Yeah. I've, just, yeah. I've just noted that down. We'll get into what Great. went but, wrong to produce the right, yeah? But yeah, we're kind of at this, I guess, bit of an inflection point where um, we've got like one client experience we build. It's largely technology enabled. It's built on the client's values, intentions, financial well-being. Um, it's pretty consistent and repeatable. We just need the right people, advisors to drive it. So, you know, we've gone from a team of five to a team of 15, 16, 17 in the last two, two and a half mm. years and still on the lookout to add more advisors to the team. We've added four female advisors so far this year and hopefully more soon. And, you know, we're, you know, a lot of things are going in the right direction. Um, Isn't it's it a great that you version. can sum that up in a two minute conversation? And, and, yet, uh, and yet, we know in reality that starting a business from scratch is no easy feat and has taken several years to get to where you want to do to, that. To, in the first few years, I imagine, were quite hard slog. Absolutely, they were. Yeah, I, I'd never want to go back there, to be honest. Um, I was overworked, I was burnt out. Um, it puts downward pressure on your own health and well being, your relationships. Um, uh, your finances, all those things. And, you know, I, I, I do recommend for those that are beginning that journey and they're early in their business life, absolutely make sure you've got mentors that have walked a similar path to the one you want to walk because what they can do is point out the obvious errors that you're making in your thinking and your execution to help you so sidestep some of those issues, whether it's a product to market fit or how you price or your commercial thinking or what clients you're going after or how you're marketing or whatever. Because um, you know it was a it was a rewarding but really challenging and a points painful experience the first three to three and a half years. I yeah, think. and I think it's the same for most practices that's, that uh, start out in that phase. And I think it's a nice segue um, into into what you were speaking about today, which was is tech the savior? And you talked about this really arduous, grimy journey. Did technology play a part in alleviating? what was quite heavy in addition to the mentorship that you've obviously played a part in that. Did, did it play a role? Can you comment on that? I can. Yeah, I can. Um, it's interesting how things unfold because some things have unfolded for us um, in ways we hadn't anticipated. And I think we've become recognised as a firm that's integrated technology really well into the client experience and operationalised the business really well on the, on the back of that. Um, but some of those things were a little bit fortuitous. So we got a great head of ops uh, about four to four and a half years ago, Daniel Donovan, who you've interviewed recently, Fraser, you know, and he come from the Apple Genius Bar, you know, so he's really helped advisors and people that, you know, are advice-minded rather than technology-minded, helped us kind of solve 
common consistent problems in in the financial planning experience so i think when you think about the role of technology to be what we spoke about is it's not trying to replace the human and the nuanced conversations and emotional intelligence and all those things it's taking all the simple things that happen consistently through the advice process for client and advisor and firm and trying to remove as much friction from those as possible to do them better and to do them do them faster whether it's booking meetings getting pre-meeting tasks done file noting capturing data transferring data preparing documents getting documents signed off all those things so um you know, it's over time. It's taken a bit of a life of its own, and the mm. experience is pretty well technology enabled. But you know, a lot of these things have just kind of happened organically, with an, an intent to to improve and solve problems rather than to find technology. But they kind of converge together at the same time to solve a lot of problems. I yeah, you, you've certainly um, promoted that culture within the business of being able to solve and innovate and continually improve, uh, which has been a big part of the drive. And the technology has sort of come after that. You know, you've worked out you need something and you find something for it. Um, you know, I know you've got a large technology stack. You use a lot of things, products. I'm interested around what business should, should be spending as part of their budget, budgeting towards technology, what they should be, you know, how, how deep they should go. Obviously, it takes, it requires a lot to be able to have the resources to, to have, take the time. And like you said, you've got, you know, a lot of staff now and you, and you can you can divvy that up. But even in the initial years, what, what sort of investment should be businesses be making in their technology stack? It's a good question. I probably can't answer that definitively, but I can talk perhaps more more generally to say that a lot of the tech that you're going to find in a tech stack isn't actually that expensive. And it's not really advice tech a a lot of the time. So a lot of the things that we're actually doing through the advice process aren't, you know, they're not, they weren't born out of financial planning, like getting documents signed, capturing data, transferring data, getting surveys done, reminding people about meetings, reminding when they haven't completed a pre-meeting task. And there's lots of great apps and tools and tech out there to, to do these things. And a lot of these are like, where it's Typeform with us for online surveys or it's Calendly for online bookings or it's Loom for recording meetings or it's Zoom for doing meetings. Um, a lot of these are quiller for client agreements like a lot of these cost like under 70 bucks each a month so the cost is really minuscule relative to the roi so it's dependent upon the the business and the clients and what problems they're trying to solve but i think you can get a lot of what you need to solve a lot of consistent problems at a really low price point i think when you think bigger picture and you're thinking about like what is our crm what is that do we have a client portal and how are those things integrating that's another conversation there's much higher cost but I think um, I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit mm. for advisors and firms out there and we were having a quick chat before we jumped on air and, and you were mentioning I, I guess that that person who really enjoys that space and exploring what might work and what might resolve that friction point that's why that person like if someone's going to make an investment to your first question Fraser is it's probably the person who seeks out the solution to that little friction point that happens repeatedly through the business and that's just so native for them rather than like someone who's trying to do advice do all the things and then go and find some sort of tool to solve a problem like it's it is two distinct roles we're finding How, what would your comment around I that absolutely be absolutely concur and i think this is one of the things that holds a lot of businesses back from better integrating technology you know i kind of Feel, it's kind of like the brain. Like they say we use like 5% of the brain or something less. Advice firms would use way less than 5% of the available tools and technology to help solve their problems. And to your point, Danny, I think it, they need to be thinking more so about who rather than how. Mm. Like they're advisors, they're, and, but they're doing power planning and implementation and trying to market and run seminars and trying to be compliant and all of these things. And then at the same time, they're going, oh, I've got to use technology. I know I've got to do it better, but I'm not sure where to start and what to use and you know and, and you mentioned about the selection of the, sec- the technology that's just that's one component but once you actually select it you've got to launch it you've got to integrate it you're going to have te- you've got to train people you're going to have teething issues you've got to problem shoot so i don't i don't think you can build a really efficient advice business that's at the same time is is growing without having someone in your business that is not an advice person they're more of a technologist and they own that. And you're not saying to them, go and find me tech. 
they're collaborating as part of a conversation with a broader team to go, what problems are we facing? What's slowing us down? And how do we solve those problems? And when it comes to the how do we solve those, technology quite often is part, part of the solution. Mm. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's the right order in putting things because a lot of the time we see shiny things go, that's a cool tool. I wonder how I could use that in my process versus I've got a problem with my process and now I need to find the tool. Exactly right. Yeah. Mm. We could talk about this for a very long time, but I, you know, we could go deep. I, I, I love this topic. <laughs> there was topic. a look at me to say, like, can we keep going? And can, I'm we, like, can, we keep, can we keep going? So tell us a little bit about the future. What does it hold for you and your practice and where you think this is all going with, um, with the technology stack that you're using and, 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 and in the future, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, good question. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in the future because normally... You don't have I, a crystal ball? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, There's an app for that. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Uh, in ter- I guess in terms of where we're headed, as far as as far as I can see, um, is you know, we've got this client experience that's now well organised um, and it's quite repeatable and it's built again on those values, intentions, financial wellbeing of the clients. And you know we're trying to expand our reach to help more clients. Now I mentioned at the top of the chat, you know that two step kind of goal slash vision when we started Verse, you know, and we're kind of on to phase two, which is trying to scale it. You know, so we're looking for advisors and good people across Melbourne, Sydney and, and Brisbane and when we hire them, we've got co-working spaces to put them in, they can work remotely as well and we give them the tools, train them in the verse client experience um, and uh, you know, we turn more of the marketing spend on, we're lucky to get you know, a lot of leads and inquiries which we can kind of dial up so you know, the short term plan is to, to bring on more great advisors, get the people around them to support them in giving great client experiences and you know, beyond Beyond that, you know, more more broadly, um, you know, I think that you know, advice is um, is moving into a really good space where we're going to be we're going to begin thinking about building businesses that are client experience led rather than compliance led. And I think mm-hmm. Michelle Levy's proposals are going to um, hopefully really kind of catapult us in that direction. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Now, when we talk about scale, I've got a couple of quick questions on scale. Um, scaling with more people. But also, how are we scaling with getting more clients or more advisors looking after more clients to, and adding that as a scale? Good question. Yeah, there's a few elements to it. So, I mean, firstly, to bring the advisors on, we've got to have the leads and the new clients for them. So, we scale our marketing. A lot of our marketing is digital marketing. We've worked with a digital marketing agency for two and a half years now. Um, a lot of that's run through Google Ads. So we've got a high predictability around what we can spend based on search volumes in these, in these cities relative to what kind of volume of leads we'll get and what quality of leads we'll get. So that's relatively predictable at this point and we know we've got a lot of up a lot of upside there. But then to, to the next part is well when we've got the advisor and we're bringing them on, how do we get them through things more efficiently um, so they can serve more clients? Um, I probably owe you a thank you actually, Fraser, because we launched video our own version of video SOAs six weeks ago, inspired by you and Ben and the work you guys have done with the FPA and over the course of the last six weeks, we have almost got rid of power planning. You know, the average SOA has gone from being eight and a half hours to being a two to two and a half hour document. It's not even a statement of advice. It's called a summary of advice. It's 20 pages, five minutes to consume, seven of the 20 pages of pictures. Um, it's just the good stuff, none of the jargon. Um, we don't do file notes. Every meeting's recorded in person or on Zoom. Um, very little ROAs. Um, and the, the statement of advice now is a digital folder. So I think Dropbox, but call statement of advice. And in there is a recording, a summary of advice, PDSs, meeting slides. And um, you know, it's the things that are value adding that the client would want that are relevant. And um, we've made really significant inroads recently. And yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm that's he- a lot I'm, of I'm hours to, saved. Yes, I'm here to say thank you, Fraser. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, I, owe wow. you, I owe you a fireball later on. <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's the drink of the Congress, Danny tells me. <laughs> it's <laughs> a drink we're trying to avoid tonight, but yes, it's suddenly becoming drink of Congress. Thank you very much. It's, it's amazing to see something that has been a, pro- a pet project or a passion project of mine take off and then help firms in such a great, great way. Uh, we probably should finish it there. Thank you so much for coming and chatting with us on the on the podcast. It's been amazing. Uh, yeah, lots hope- of value as per usual, Corey. Thank you for dropping by. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Fraser. Great to be here. Hello and welcome back to this special podcast series we are doing from the Financial Planning Association Conference uh, here in Sydney, uh, brought to you by XY and the FPA. Uh, Danny, thanks for joining me again. I'm still here, Fraser. <laughs> 
I can't believe it. Believe it or not, I haven't gone anywhere. Even it. though lunch is is served, I'm still hitting, sitting here just looking at it because we have a very interesting guest. And I'm just – Nicolette, we'll get you to introduce yourself because uh, what you've done and what you're looking at doing and, and your session – it's so unique that I can't put a summary around it, so we'll get you to explain that. But you, climate and finance professional. Hmm. So, hi, Danny. Hi. <laughs> hi. Thanks for joining us. Can you tell us about yourself, sure, Nicolette? Sure. That would be great so that we can all get a better understanding of how these two things meet. Okay. Um, it's actually, yeah, it's not an easy answer. Hmm. I have been, I suppose, um, involved in clean energy and climate policy for uh, many decades. I have retreated a little bit in the last decade and and found myself in finance. So most recently I've spent around uh, or probably seven years as an executive at the Responsible Investment Association Australasia, who is exhibiting here today as Pop well. Pop down and see them. <laughs> um, and my role has been research policy, but one particular interest is um, of mine in my job there was running the certification program. So that's the kicking the tyres and lifting the bonnet of anybody out there who's trading with any kind of product that makes a sustainability claim. Can I ask you a quick question? Did you start that up? Was that... With that certification, or was that something that was existing when you started there? It was existing. Um, it's been around now for probably around 14 or 15 years, but when I came on board to help out, it, it was going through its very first governance review. Um, and you, I don't have to tell you, but it is a rapidly, rapidly evolving space, and so the governance structure to be really nimble and, and adaptive to all sorts of new products coming on the market uh, and people wanting to add these interesting things onto their APLs and we needed to put an assurance level over the top of that. Yep, and we've uh, we've we've done a lot of series on X Y the podcast before. Mm. We're going in this are in and around this subject. The um, infrastructure as well that an advisor needs to put in their business to make sure that there's credibility in what they tell to their clients. So huge, huge subject. We could be on that for twenty to thirty minutes. Absolutely, <laughs> as we better, we better not. Uh, so, so tell us about. So you've done that. Um, uh, tell us about what led you into today's yeah. session. Okay, so. Um, my whole career has really just been about redefining what good is. And um, that's, you know, the certification program was, was part of that. Um, I have most recently um, run as a community independent in the electorate of Bradfield, Sydney's Upper North Shore. Um, people say, oh, you're a failed to you. I say, actually, this is stunningly quite impressive um, success in a short runway. Um, achieved the, the, the largest primary swing against a sitting member anywhere in the country. And um, the once was quite safe conservative seat is is marginal, and um, so what um, Dave Ray, my financial planner, who I'm talking with today um, in conversation, and I will be discussing is really having a look at the extent to which understanding how people voted in the federal election in May this year might give planners an insight as to how some of those people who live in those areas of Sydney and Brisbane and Melbourne may want to also change the way that they invest their money, not just their vote. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. We don't often get into the concept of politics on the XY Advisor podcast, <laughs> but we're kind of touching we're, we're on it today because <laughs> it's absolutely relevant to the conversation around uh, that, that you're presenting on today. Um, I'm, I'm a bit oblivious to um, a lot of the politics side, which I'm quite happy to say. Um, but t- t- tell us about, so, so did you pitch this idea to the, the, to the conference or was this something that was, how, how did this conversation come up? Um, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. It could have been Dave Ray, my planner. Um, I think there is just, it's just a different place now. We had uh, some six, seven different electorates that went independent. Um, some of them also went um, from some sort of blue to red. Politics aside, this was all about issues this time. This was about largely integrity uh, and improving public trust between the people and the parliament, really heavily about climate action. And then there were other issues that had prevalence in different seats, such as um, the treatment of women, um, refugees, and, and other things. But by and large, I mean, there's, there's something that we talk about now in, in the, the Sydney area is that you can no longer take a Sydney Harbour ferry to a Liberal seat. It's completely changed. And so, and I don't think that the people so much have changed, the party's a little bit changed, but um, what we really saw um, is that the people who voted differently this time are in areas where 
there are uh, highly educated professional women who work overrepresent compared to the Australian average in finance, insurance, science, and professional services, mm. and um, and they have financial means, and so they said. That's enough. Um, we really, really want to see action on climate change. Yes. And I can actually add some credibility uh, to that because it is very rare and, and this is, you know, lots of my own personal opinions. So if you don't agree with them, that's fine. Just we send me the note. We love opinions. <laughs> Let's go. <But> the, <laughs> I think there is a, um, a lot of people are a bit disenfranchised because climate change, big issue, how much impact do you think you're having? But I live in Bondi. I was one of those people... Who, uh, who just wanted to make a statement. And I have always um, been, you know, interested enough to my level of knowledge of, and who I'm voting for. And I just was like, oh, I'm, I'm just going to make a statement. So it's a very, um, it's a very true fact that uh, people said, well, how else do I have a voice? How else do I, you know, is... And, and I hope this is taking the right way, but taking a keep cup and getting my coffee isn't really making the change that... I, I want to see. So, how else do you do that? It was so it was so interesting that everyone's little independent, independent sort of um, statement was so widely done. So, I think it does have a huge influence. So, that's why I was very interested in this conversation yeah. because it's it was very real for me, and I'm sure many of the conversations that I had with with people after the election, it was very real for many people. Kind of sick of not a lot happening. So, yeah, Danny, that's really interesting. I have spent my whole career looking at different ways um, that businesses, um, government and consumers can be part of the climate solution. And hands down, the most effective way, yes, you're right, is not the key cut, but every single thing counts, right? Um, it's also not necessarily buying an electric vehicle or even taking public transport. Even though they, are fan- they are fantastic options if they're available to you. What is the most impactful is how you put your money to work. Yeah. And so many people expect that their money is not doing harm when they hand that over to a planner who then invests or advises to whom they should um, entrust their money in funds. And, and the Responsible Investment Association has done longitudinal consumer research, which shows that apart from just not doing harm, a large majority of people now expect that their their money is being invested to do good. And um, and there's different definitions around what good is, yeah? So, um, you know, my big challenge to um, the conference um, later today is going to be understanding how people change their vote is probably, you know, the canary in the mine. I know that's not the mo- or the, 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 you know, the red-bellied parrot on the blade of the <laughs> wind farm. <laughs> right. There's a hint okay. of what's coming, coming right. in, in mainstream. Yeah, exactly. That... Um, not people in these places already choose where they put their kids into schools, yeah? We, we, we make decisions every day about our values through the decisions we make when we consume eggs and schooling for our children. Our, how and where we put our money is just another thing, another way that people are starting to really take action. And so that's all it is. It's, mm. it, it, there's a real risk if you're not involved and you don't, you don't understand how to have a conversation with your clients about these issues. And there's only an uptick to um, improve your skills and and maybe, hopefully, your, your approved product list as well. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head when you mentioned the word values there. It certainly is the conversation, isn't it? It's, it's about going, one, what we're talking about in the, in what you were talking about in the session is the fact that a lot of the clients and the databases of the, the, the planners in the room will be in those seats. Uh, or in around those seats, and they've definitely made a stand around what their values are towards um, towards their lifestyle, I guess. Uh, and when we talked about, I've seen some of the publications that you produced around how that money, that investment money, influences companies, whether it be you know directly because they're not investing in them, or whether it be they have seats on the on the boards of those companies, and, and what sort of a change that makes. But it starts with the decision between the consumer and the financial planner about how it's being invested. That's exactly right. And often, you know, the consumer or the, the investor themselves doesn't know how to have those conversations. Mm. So the onus of responsibility is increasingly on the planner. And I think it's just good business to, when you really want to seek out to understand the goals of your client, yeah, I think it goes hand in hand. You know, it's not just about retiring at a certain age with a certain um, level of, of material wealth in, in certain different types of asset classes, but also, yeah. Do they want to? What? Where do they fit on this spectrum of avoiding harm? 
to doing good, to making real, genuine, deep impact. Yeah, and I think the conversations on anything ESG are quite prolific in XY. So we have a community where advisors share and learn from one another and they do that sort of digitally and so there's lots of conversations on questions and queries. And it's apparent that, you know, the, there's a – everyone sort of – not everyone, but there's a – there's a trend for people to want to step into this space, but perhaps there's a hurdle of infrastructure, of knowledge gap, of if I enter into this arena, there are so many avenues and as someone who is the trusted professional and providing advice, what would your, what would your uh, suggestion to be to people that you've maybe seen them take this new journey of conversation? How would they start so it's not overwhelming and they don't feel like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get into this situation where I open and Pandora's box and I don't know yeah. how to manage that and really come across as someone who's credible and knows their stuff. It's a really good question that I think a lot of planners ask and it's a reason that some planners or many planners don't take that step. And it, and I have to be completely honest, it's really messy. Yeah. Mm. So um, you need a big courage injection (laughs) but it's doing things like people are doing today by coming to this congress it's about mucking in and listening to peers people that have gone first hearing their war stories of things that they ought not to do next time and it's about building it's it's not jumping into becoming a ethical investor or advisor it's this is about who you are and what your mojo is and it's about adapting it and branching it out just gently changing the conversation. I'm really looking forward to listening to Dave Ray because he's done this. He's been a mainstream investor, uh, sorry, financial planner, mm. who had what I call the Johnny Come Lately, um, you know, <laughs> his eyes opened and went, oh, we saw this ethical stuff. And so he's going to have some um, hope, some good tips about yeah. um, how he did it. But um, it, it's gentle. And, and I think uh, personally, I think it's okay to start with a fact find that's just a handful of questions that help somebody, just as you have a, a question around the spectrum of risk, you ask a question about your spectrum of interest of avoiding harm through to doing good to making a really good impact. And even if that is all you ask the first time, you can start to build out questions and go deeper. Yeah, I think uh, there's obviously a great community within the, within the XY community, within the, the, the Financial Planning Association communities, where people have that genuine interest in helping other planners do do these things and helping other advisors. Mm-hmm. So I think, uh, you know, there's obviously a, a few superstars. We, we, we sort of that stand out in the space, David being one of them. Um, but just to be able to reach out to those people and, and ask them how they how they got started, I think it's a good start. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us today. We wish you all the best for your presentation. I feel like we got the sneak, the sneak preview um, uh, because it was before the presentation that we recorded this. But, uh, yeah, thank you so much for uh, coming and sharing your gems. Absolutely. Welcome. Thank you, Fraser. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. G'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Clayton here. I'm finally back on the airwaves. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> I'm here with Jason Andreessen and, of course, Danny, there's a mate. How was the presentation? How did it go? Talk to us. Um, what were the what were kind of what was the key messages that you were looking to get over? So it was a peer to peer session. Um, practice management around profitability of clients, how to make every client profitable, and we were targeting as much wisdom coming from the floor as as much wisdom was coming from the um, the stage. And I think we achieved that. It was a really good discussion. When when you come up with the concept of making every client profitable, how much do you lean on your financial planning chops compared to your research chops? Probably both equally. Um, the, the research chops um, help with measuring it and um, mm. keeping it objective, but uh, the technical advice elements are... Um, are essential as well. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And Jason, for those playing at home and listening in, uh, can you give us a little as to why you've got these different elements to, to your experience? Can you give us a little bit of a quick highlight reel of your background and, yeah. and why the FPA have actually asked you to do a session, which is really valuable to if every advisor could make sure they're dealing with highly profitable yeah. clients, that yeah. would be a great outcome. What, what's led you here? So I am a proud CFP professional. I uh, have been for 22 years. Um, non-practicing at the moment. May practice in the future. 
I spent six years practicing as a financial planner. I've worked in, I won't bore you, but I've worked in boutiques, a bank, and an industry super fund. So I've really all, all, um, all facets of the industry. And um, spent 10 years in executive management of a large licensee and then got out. And uh, I've been a researcher now for five years. And the research is the best move I've ever made. Never before had I actually enjoyed... I enjoyed work, I enjoyed, but it was mostly about um, the achievement and working with people. But with research, I actually enjoy the work. And, that, and that's because of the, the nature of discovery. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you're um, casting a net and you're creating new intelligence. That, that, that's what appeals to you? Yeah, yeah. Um, curious to, to learn, frankly, and um, to have a mechanism to have the resources to find out what you're curious about is, is, yeah. an, amazing, is an amazing opportunity, right? Um, yeah, and we can do it quickly. Please. Yeah. Well, an example is um, when the levy um, proposals came out around the, the um, furor around the two-tier um, advisors, mm-hmm. we went to um, 400 consumers and asked them um, whether super advice is all they need and their confidence as to whether they are in the right super fund. What was the answer? 67%, two-thirds of general population, over 45, said that they um, would, would just take um, superannuation advice. So, so a simple scout advice? It wasn't framed like that. It was framed as free advice in relation sure. to my superannuation. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, and, and, and I guess this is probably where your research leads to. Who needs advice and who can pay for advice and, and the types of clients that advisors have been looking after for a long time, they're not going anywhere. I, I, I honestly believe that um, scout advice is simply filling a hole for people who do not yet have access to solutions. I don't see it as a threat to uh, the existing financial planning business model in, in the slightest. I, I think they're two completely separate um, separate services and it goes to this two tier if that's the best way to think of it types of advice yeah I agree with you Clayton um, to, to a nuance I think the I think of the market the, the, the client bases the consumers as being in three cohorts okay um, the, the wealthy currently advised people with complexity they're going to be um, served more efficiently. Fantastic. There's this cohort in middle Australia that our research shows they actually benefit the most, and I'll come back to that. Interesting. And they have been orphaned by the institutions leaving. Yes. Um, And they still want advice, and um, they want active relationships, and uh, and they're having trouble finding that... that, um, the financial planner to help them. The um, the super funds are absolutely going to help the lower tier. That's not necessarily middle Australia. Certainly, I think. And all power to them. Oh my they. God! Absolutely, yeah. How, in, in no way is that seen as a horrible thing. I think, or, or, although that, yeah, okay. The financial planners, there's no revenue for us to make in that in that space. But goodness, it should definitely exist for uh, that segment of society. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the benefits to them will be extraordinary. I agree. Come, I come back to the middle Australia argument. Um, our research, my Maven's research, shows that 45-year-olds plus, um, middle Australia, benefit most from the financial aspects of financial advice and the non-financial aspects. So they benefit from paying less tax, um, saving more, allocating their money better in the long run, right? They get wealthier. They're able to do more, achieve more in their lives. They're the financial aspects. The non-financial aspects are they are they're able to envisage, advised middle Australians are able to envisage a positive future. When you can envisage a positive future, 
you can, uh, it improves your emotional experience today. So they're happier. What price do you put on that? They also have a sense of control, which is important. It's, uh, they're more resilient when things go wrong. They've got more confidence in their ability. They've got more capability. They get a, they've got a better understanding of their values and they're living in accordance with them. All good things. All good things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I think that is the opportunity for financial planners to, um, to reach out to, to middle Australia with a more affordable platform. So how do you see that working kind of tangibly? Like what's, you know, to ensure all clients are profitable, what are the suggestions you kind of make that planners approach that with and put a price on it? Because a lot of the questions we get in XY is around what should my pricing structure be? Like that's one of the most popular conversations in XY. Like how do I go about increasing freeze? How do I actually price my advice? Do you have any take-home tips around that, Jason? George Akerlof. Um, is a Nobel, Nobel Prize winning um, economist and he wrote a paper on the market for lemons. Have you heard of that? No. Fascinated though. Market, market for lemons was um, market for, for lemon cars, cars like bomb, bomb cars. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. And it was all about information asymmetry. So the, the idea is I've got a car I want to sell. I think it's a great car. I know it's a great car. It's been running for 10 years. I'm taking it to the market, but the market doesn't know it's a great car. So the market prices it like it would a lemon. So I've got two choices. I, I sell it or I take it away. And that's, that's when it becomes a market for lemons. There's a, there's a third way. There's a third way you um, address the information asymmetry by bringing its client value proposition to life. We've done lots of research and it came up today in our session what are clients willing to pay for advice? Yeah. And inevitably, there's a proportion that are willing to pay a maximum of nil. Uh, naturally. Yeah. Um, the average is generally three to 500 bucks. But it's an unfair question because they don't, they don't know mm-hmm. what's involved and they don't know the utility of it. They don't know the benefits of it. So what, what, what the culmination of that is, is... Um, is that um, we need to bring our value proposition and our service offers to life and um, be generous up front to show how we can solve the client's, the client's problem. Actually, you raise a really interesting point here. With the question, uh, how much are you willing to pay for advice? Be- and, and going along with that theme that you were just speaking about, Unless the question is even asked with the illustration of what the outcomes and the value and all of the benefits of advice are explained to the person who is being asked the question, yeah. then they're naturally going to not attribute much value to it. So it's, it's, I understand what you're talking about here. It's almost like the original research question, whoever conducted this you know, maximum that people are willing to pay for advice, $500, story that got out there mm. I think what you're saying is the issue here is a part of the question is the question was a it wasn't a great question it wasn't a great question that's a really good point I hadn't thought of that before yeah something that I really loved in what you said there you to address it you have to be like say someone does have you know has to understand the value of, of advice and that often evolves over many years got to be generous up front was two words you said you know to overcome that say that pricing barrier or concern be generous up front and that was such a lovely way of sort of putting what the I guess the challenge that every advisor has in a client interaction particularly with a new client Mm. what does generous look like generous looks like at the 80% 80% level, not, not, not getting into the weeds. Clients come to you with a job to be done in their minds. Something has got them out of bed and, and, and um, motivated them to make an appointment. Answering that job to be done to the 80% level is, is really where I would start. Mm, it's a fantastic insight. Yeah. Um, don't tell them how to do it. To show them that it can be done. That makes sense. And then so to, I guess, give us a summary on 
the the topic that was just being discussed, which is how do you make all clients profitable? What 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 is what what is your sort of take out from that? It needs to lead with the clients. So um, client segmentation uh, and um, working from there. So there are many ways to segment a client. Let's let's choose a common way. Um, wealth and complexity. Let's just stick with that. Matching the value proposition, the service offer to the client need in that segment is, is, is really what it's about. Now, at the moment, that's much easier to make profitable when you're dealing with people with three million bucks. You can charge them $10,000 a year yeah, and, um, and make a healthy profit margin. And with the advice gap, that's possible these days, right? Um, be selective of which clients you deal with. Yes. The opportunity down the track is to um, is to have a different proposition where we don't need to produce an SOA. Um, can be more strategic, um, more goals based, and um, could be delivered much more cheaply than the. Um, 17 or 18 hours that, that advisors take at the moment to deliver advice. That, that all swings on being able to um, deliver, the, deliver on the cost, cost to serve reductions. As a, as a result of the, the review that's going on at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Makes sense. Jason, it's been so lovely to have this discussion. There's been so many um, tangible takeouts that I'm sure oh, a lot true. of, uh, I know our, our X1 network will find really useful and also the people who didn't happen to make it to the FPA Congress. So thank you so much. Good luck with the two parts of, of this big discussion and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. We are still here. I'm still here, actually. Fraser has gone to do a, a speaking session mm-hmm. at our Congress today. So we have a guest co-host. Yes. Hello, Clayton. Hello. Welcome to the seat. Thank you. He's on a good behaviour bond. <laughs> yeah. I'm not allowed to intro any more podcasts. <laughs> Look, this is really exciting. We get to take people who are spreading amazing ideas on the Congress stage and we get to figure out what that session is all about, who they are, why they've been asked to speak. And we have Melanie Drago. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks yes. for joining us, Melanie. That's okay. Pleasure to be here. For people listening, can you tell us who you are and then we'll get to what your session is all about and then what you want people to take out of it. For sure. Um, so my name's Melanie Drago, as been introduced. Um, I'm the founder of Tango, which is a platform that connects power planners and financial advisors, like an air tasker type thing. Mm. And it's really for those small businesses that just need out of a power planning or just really cost-effective power planning with flexible solutions. Clayton's doing really cute faces at me. Ah. <laughs> um, and Our last guest said the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the other, the other, I'm um, also the admin for the Paraplan Hub, which is just a community um, specifically for paraplanners. It's mostly sharing ideas. Um, and also, I've been a paraplanner for a very long time. I started back in 2000, 2002, uh, did that for a while. Then I worked at AXA, managing the advice documents and template team for those that were there. Um, and then I've done a bit of other work with uh, digital industry fund services and Mm. all that sort of stuff and and that's why I'm here now. So I think the idea was me to bring some um, insights on where you could go to as a power planner, what power planners do because as you know or you may not know, there's no real definition of a power planner. Uh, It sort of just formed and became what it is today because of evolution and there's no real industry. Power planner is someone who does the technical stuff, maybe does some admin, maybe helps a planner in doing client work there's no real definition um i'd love that to change but my idea was uh, is that going to evolve into something else with the new changes to qua and all that sort of stuff are power planners still going to be needed and that was sort of the theme of the today session so right yeah that's an interesting concept uh in the event that um that michelle levy's proposals were to be accepted as they are yeah, that's a good point. Uh, power planning would, would change. It, naturally, it would, yeah. And I think um, some people are going, oh, well, there's no SOAs. You don't need power planners. And I think 
that's really sort of minimising the jobs and the roles that power planners do. And I think that was part of the what we discussed today. What do power planners do? And it's not just writing an SOA. They help with doing the projections and understanding the software well enough to do the projections and doing the research and, and being that second set of eyes on compliance and actually helping the advisor and maybe being a stepping, stepping stone to advising and yep. being that business succession sort of person as well. So there's a whole heap of things that power planners can do. And I think to say that if SOAs were gone, which maybe it's not going to be an SOA in the current format, but maybe another document you've got to produce. I don't think power planners are going anywhere. To well, documentation going. isn't going anywhere. Yeah. Maybe, it, maybe it's the existing statement format. of, yeah, precisely. Maybe it's not going to say you have to have a statement of advice on the front screen and it's going to be there. And yeah. Be, it might be you could have it as visual, you could have it in digital, you could have it as sure. a video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think that... But they all need to be created. And you've still got to do and, research. And rev- yeah, reviewed and someone has to speak to the product provider and... Yeah, and one of the questions was, how do you how do you prove that we still need power plans? And I'll like, I'll sit an advisor down in front of uh, one of the modelling softwares and ask them to punch out three scenarios, and they'll go, get stuffed. Uh, I want the power planner back. So. I, 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 best response would be fire your power planner and see how long you last. Yeah, that's right. But I, and and power planners love being that person, that back end person helping advice because yeah. half of them. I did a survey. And the majority of them were like, I am not a client-facing person. I'm not a people person. I want to be in the back end. I want to do all the number crunching. They want the advisor to do that. And they respect and love advisors being there doing that client doing stuff. Front totally. stuff. Yeah. So when you're hiring and you're looking for someone to be a power planner and be in your business for a long time, what are you, what are you hunting for? Do you always go for the exp- – because talent is a big issue in advice at, a, at an advisor level and I'm presuming as well at a power planning level. Yeah. So how do you find great power planners? I think there's a massive issue here. There's some really good power planners that have been around for a long, long time. They were trained up by the corporates or they're trained up in small businesses. Um, they've got all the skills that you need to be power planners, but they're far and few between. Some of them are leaving the industry. Some of them want to be advisors or what have, what have you. And there's this new gen- we need this new generation of power planners, but the problem is, one, who's trading them up? Boutique, I would say boutique offices are maybe not the best uh, stomping ground to get your hands in power planning. You need to be trained properly. Um, so that's an issue for talent. We don't have new power planners that are being trained properly and that needs to be addressed by the industry. Is that's that so capacity? Yeah. yeah. Here you go. Well, well, what, yeah, so how, why do you think that boutique isn't a great pl- because the but advantage of time. boutique is you're everywhere I do agree but do advisors have time to commit to uh, training a power planner properly or they can go quickly just do it like this so I haven't got time to show you the proper way that's definitely true yes so I think that like and it's not that they won't do it properly if they had time mm. but who's gonna they need someone to sit next to them and show them how to do it properly gotcha yeah so mm. boutique's not the best place to do yeah, that understand. right mm. um, so that's a problem but when I look for a power planner I look like someone who's detail oriented obviously I mean and good with numbers is good obviously you're dealing with numbers all the time but I think the other thing which is important which most people don't realise is to have that big picture overview of a strategy because this might be right here but when you look at the big picture it's not correct so people that can see the bigger picture and understand if the strategy is right and just look at the holistic view of that advice, which is really important, not just looking at the detail and the t- corrections and all that, the numbers, but just the big picture, which is what financial planning is about, isn't it? Totally. Yeah, strategy. Yeah. So, yeah. so your marketplace, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, in, it's based in Australia, so you've got yeah. Australian-based power planners. Nice. So there's obviously a trend where there's a, there's a lot of offshoring in this, this space. What would your comments be on that? Like what, what sort of business owners um, seek out that Australian – because, you know, you've got different options and different options suit different businesses. Correct. When does an Australian-based power planner suit and when does an offshore power planner suit? Uh, definitely space for both. Uh, offshore is an excellent solution that people are more cost-sensitive. They want something that's cheap for their business because they haven't got that capacity to pay for an onshore, an onshore power planning in your office could be 80, 100 grand for a really experienced power planner. That's a lot of money for a business to fork out. So offshore is a great solution. Uh, Tango has contract Australian power planners. Some planners and licensees want their stuff to be onshore just from data reasons and that's fair enough. Um, Others like the fact that they can just, they know they're around the corner and they've been in the industry for a long, long time and they've got that experience where you find more offshore, probably more 
not as they haven't been doing it for 10, 15 years. They're probably newer mm. para planners, so they want that experience. So they want the really good technical para planners, and I find that the Australian ones are sort of in that realm. Mm. So I think that's the differences. But then I've got some that would have both. So they have offshore for their smaller, less complex SOAs. Then they'd use onshore for the really technical, complex ones where the SOA's got to be spot on, language, everything's got to be right. So, yeah. My, my final question um, to you, Melanie, is if I've got a great para planner and talent is, is hard, how do I keep that person happy? What, what's my employee value proposition got to be so that I have a really yeah, good relationship and a long relationship with this person who I really value and is yeah. an important contributor? I've, and power planners, I find they can, to lose a power planner when you've invested so much time and energy in that person or train them up is really heartbreaking. And I find a lot of advisors come to me because they've lost their power planner. Um, I can tell you now, if you want someone in your office, it's definitely flexibility is what power planners go for. And often they will go to contract power planning and leave an office because of the flexibility that contract power planning provides. So if you're in your office and you want an office power planner, I suggest flexibility is key. Uh, development and training, so paying for them to come to something like this where they can get exposure to this sort of environment, mm. that would be a great value add. Um, giving them CPD training, giving them education and even developing, like it, if they want to sit in front of clients, develop them in that way because you won't get that as contract power planning. So giving things that they want. But flexibility, I can tell you now, and probably... Sorry to say it, but salary. If you're going to pay them really low wage when they can get more doing contract power planning with the flexibility, you're not, never going to win. What's low, medium and high? Because we often get a lot of responses to when we put out like, what does someone get paid? It's a really important question. In your experience, what's that range? I just did a survey. I can tell you the average uh, salary for a power planner based on the survey that I did was 160 people. Uh, for in-house office was about 70 to 85 um, and then if the more senior ones that have over 15 years' experience, you're probably pushing over 100. Um, for a contract power planner, they usually charge between, for a standard couple SOA, say retiree going into retirement phase, you're probably going to see about 500 to 650 for an SOA. So then you work out, I think that's what a business needs to do. Is it worth, if I'm only doing one SOA a month, is it worth just getting a contract power planner? Or if I can resource out that power planner in-house to do more than just power planning and maybe do some sort of succession planning and helping with the advice, then I would think that a power planner in-house would be a better proposition. So, yeah. Mm, fantastic. That's been such um, amazing business planning strategy insights for people. So thank you for sharing them with us, Melanie. And, and Claim, do you have any other questions before we sign off? I just like I just like that, um, you know, that you got a passion for power planning. Like I started out, I came over from accounting into power planning originally. And uh, yeah, it's it's a super, super valuable part of the advice, the entire advice, advice process. And uh, yeah, it's, I'm just stoked that someone's sort of making sure that, that people are paying attention to it more yeah. than anything. Yeah. The industry needs, to be honest, the industry needs to pay attention to it because one, there's no definition of power planner. There's no qualifications for power planning. Yeah. So you have someone who's doing all the calculation strategy and stuff like that and essentially doesn't need any qualifications. Yeah. So why is that? Um, we're talking about an industry that doesn't look at compliance people. What do they need to be to compliance people? We've got people that have probably done no law, nothing like that, and building licensee rules, auditing and doing all that. Why is that? Why hasn't the industry decided... An advisor needs to do this, but also these industry participants should have these qualifications to make sure we're all humming beautifully. Agreed. Yeah. So fantastic. Yeah, no well, thanks worries. for coming on. <laughs> and before we before we uh, we get out of this particular episode, the FPA do have support for power planners in this power planning hub, which is no, yeah, that's no, what, there's no? no FPA. Okay, but I think they're coming. They're working with me. To oh, do okay, to bring in. Yeah, okay, hopefully. so so we'll see what this Bit of secret squirrel, but it's something exciting's maybe, coming maybe soon. We'll okay, <laughs> fantastic. Thanks for joining us, Melanie. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Danny. Bye. Welcome, everyone. We are entering deep afternoon time, mm -hmm. and you'll be probably able to tell that from this particular fireside chat. So throughout today, we have been taking the speakers, the people who are deeply involved in the FPA, and understanding the highlight reel of what their session is about, who they are, how they got there, what, what's their role within the FPA community. So Fraser's darted off because he's got speaking commitments mm -hmm. and we have a stand-in, Clayton. Hello, welcome. Welcome. 
And we have a very important guest who's done a lot for this particular Congress. <laughs> so we're about to bring in some margaritas just for some sugar. So thank you for joining us, uh, David. David, do you want to give us a little bit of you, – you you hold a lot of roles. You, you run a business. You're the FPA chair. You do things on radio. I can't explain all the things you do. It's best you give everyone a little summary of who you are and how you ended up being involved in the FPA. Mm. Yeah. Oh, look, the biggest time commitment at the moment is I'm also involved in cricket. I've got three boys who play cricket. And I tell people this – uh, 20 hours on the weekend of cricket every weekend, right? If you if you have a look side on, you'll see I've got the sunglass tan to prove <laughs> that that is indeed actually the case. So that's my weekends and, you know, maybe in the lunch breaks so I do some work and stuff as well. All right, yeah, look, yeah, you're right, a number of different roles and it's definitely a, a juggling act. Um, yeah, so I run a small practice in Perth. I'm a, I'm a financial planner. I It's my day job. I sit in front of clients all day, every day. We get to learn about their lives and what's important to them and, and help them make good, smart money decisions. That's, that's fundamentally mm. what we do from an advice perspective. I fell into the, to the FPA onto the local chapter. Uh, a colleague of mine was getting off the chapter and I think the rule was if you got off, you had to find someone to come <laughs> on. And she went, Dave, it's you. And I was like, okay, no worries. So I got on the chapter, you know, loved being involved, put myself up for the board and managed to get elected. So awesome. So that was, that was sort of my journey into getting into, into the FPA. It was interesting, I've met, you know, subsequently you meet, you know, former CEOs and former chairs, and it was actually a former uh, Matthew Rowe and Mark Rantel many years ago basically went around the country and said, you know what, we're not going to apologize for some of the poor behavior. We're going to strive on and be a profession and be the best damn group of financial planners we can be. That just engaged me. I went, yep, yep you, yeah. know, you, you know, you had me at hello type scenario. Yeah. That, and I went, yep, this is who I, this is who I want to be a part of going forward. And so, yeah, no, I'm naturally someone who gets involved in their community. So, got involved in the, the FPA, and uh, you know, I don't know whether it's last person standing, but you know, here I am now as chair. <laughs> Maybe everyone else stood back, and I was like, "What's everyone going backwards for?" Well, actually, what we could say is, under your tenure, you you brought together the uh, the two big associations. I wouldn't say it's definitely not like it is. This is a team, right? This is sure. a collective, and and I hate the personally. I hate the whole individualizing of it all. It, sure. it is such a group. It's it's two important you know associations coming together, and it's not about it's not about us. It's about the members, right? Agreed. We are member associations, and this is this is all about members, member value, member benefit, yeah. and that's why it should come together. So, yeah, look, there's a team that put this together. Certainly, the collective board spent a lot of. Um, you know, good faith and you know, good spirit. And there's, there's nothing really too controversial. You know, there's, there's legal documents we have to get through. The, the only controversy is you know, trying to read a legal document. But ah. as a general, it, it's it's really good faith working together. Hey, um, and any any and Chatham rules here. Obviously, mm-hmm. this isn't going yeah. anywhere. Um, <laughs> yeah. any, any any preview? Hi, Mum. <laughs> How do you previews on the names? Oh, this is no. Like I can generally tell you, we don't we don't have an idea. We've just got. Uh, engage an agency to help us formulate one. Awesome. Right? Cool. So I think I've got an appointment, someone's in my diary yeah. at some point next week or week after, yes. just for my views, right? Yeah. But we, we want to go and get ideas from members as well, right? Mm, because certainly. interesting enough, I think this is almost the most important thing that people yeah. care about. Like, yeah. what's, what's it yeah. going to be called? Yeah, yeah. Um, we don't know. You know, we, the FPA was formed out of a merger of two other previous heritage organizations that weren't called the FPA. Sure. And so we'll come up with a name. And look, there's, there's two ways of looking at it. There's the, it'll involve a P and F and an A and an I, you know, some, you know, finance and professional and advisor and planner. It involves some mick along like that. And you've got to be careful that the acronym doesn't spell something that's a bit too rude or, you know, that people are going to laugh at. Um, or you can go the other way and go something that's quite, you know, sort of inspirational or whatever. My, my ah. gut feel is I think the general consensus is people would like something with finance and advisor or advice or planner or something sure. in it. And look, I, I'm not a creative person, so, well, you know, colours. Outsource it to co- the experts. Oh, just look, you know, just all that sort of stuff is. I've got a strategy for you. Ready? Yeah. So, um, just, are you give me a name and yeah, I can yeah, write yeah, it down yeah, quickly. Yeah, Hang check, on. Yeah, yeah. So, so BHP and Billiton yeah. uh, merged to become BHP Billiton. Yeah. Uh, then they just dropped Billiton. So, yeah. uh, just BHP. 
That wouldn't be. I would say though, Clayton, that wouldn't be good faith, right? <laughs> to go down that path. So it's just the FBA, AFA. Yeah, it's the FBA. F, F Paffa. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that's gonna fly. I'm not sure that's gonna oh, fly. You know. Back to the experts, hey. So, out of all the things you see, what is it that excites you about advice and what's going on in advice practices at the moment? Look, I've a lot of colleagues, and I'm from WA, so a lot of colleagues. No one's struggling to find clients at the moment. I mean, Sarah mentioned this on stage earlier. Like, there's actually never been a better... For those who are still around, there's actually never been a better time. Yeah. There's, if you think about it from a, pr- a pure crass point of view, a lot less competitors, yeah. um, lots of clients wanting your services, and it sounds like on the, hopefully on the regulatory future, lo- a lot of things are going to make our job a lot easier to deliver better and better advice to our clients. So I, I just think... I, I feel like we've gone through this dark tunnel, and, yeah. and can I just say this as well? We've had a lot of our colleagues go through some dark times as well, so we can't talk about this without acknowledging the hurt and pain that a lot of them have faced, right? And so that's really important that we acknowledge that. But I see a massive light at the end of the tunnel, and I just spoke before um, here at a like an emerging professionals and students session at Congress. Oh my God! Like it's so inspiring walking around here and seeing all these, you know, I call them young upstarts. If they're the emerging, I must be submerged, right? (laughs) Um, And it's just like these guys. You know, I think about the alumni that that started. You know, the, the, the baby steps of a profession. Mm. And we're just custodians at the moment traveling through. And it's going to be this younger generation that's going to drive this forward. Yeah, and they're going to be the most trained, ethical, yeah. eager. eager. They're going to find you. And they're not going to be, you know, I sit here. I tell you, FSRA came out in 2003 when I basically started becoming an advisor. And my fear, and people who might have started at the same time, if you don't give an FSG out in time, six months jail. Right, that was that's I still it still lives with me, but I'm hoping this this cohort come through and they're not tarnished by some of the the rules and regulations that we've had to carry now for 20 years, and they can think of new and innovative ways within the legal and ethical framework to to really deliver for their clients. Yeah, that's that's going to be super exciting to see how that goes. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, what you just described is is basically I feel there is a big positive shift in financial planning as a whole. Um, I, I just got back, i am not just got back, but earlier in the year, I uh, arrived back from UK where what you just said is what all the advisors have been saying over there for the last couple of years, which is they went through the tough times and now all of a sudden there's, there's bountif- bountiful opportunity and then the rules and regulations that came in were a were a, a a soft landing almost after all this turmoil that had gone on for years, and the way that Paul Barrett talks about it at AZNGA, he says that he thinks that we're at the start of a twenty year boom in financial planning, and I I actually couldn't agree more. Yeah, I think that's probably pretty relevant. With what is there twenty six, twenty seven million people in this country? Yeah, just under sixteen thousand advisors. Totally, we 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 can't service no. That many, so you, you know, you, if you're in a profession where there is endless demand, like demand, mm. that that's like, yeah, it's like you know, on WA, it's like a mining boom <laughs> which, type which scenario, come? you know. But you know, and that's hopefully our biggest challenge right now is then attracting that new talent. Yes, and making you know financial planning. Oh, you know, when you grow up, you know, I want to be a vet, right? Because I thought being a vet was just you help sick puppies. You know, <laughs> when you get a little bit older, you realise it was it was what you did to those sick puppies that they were no longer sick, but not for the reason you thought, right? <laughs> And so, you know, I didn't know about financial planning. Totally. If, you know, yeah. most people I ask, most people fall into it because they're, totally. they're doing something else and they go, oh, what, well, what's financial planning? And then you love it, right? Yes. So we've got to make sure that people when they, you know, year nine, year 10 and they're studying, they go, yeah, financial planning is, totally. where, you know, what I want to do. It's a vibrant career path, yeah. Oh, it's huge. I mean, and the job opportunities at the moment. Totally. I mean, if you're a student walking around here, you've probably got six job opportunities already, right? <laughs> How good, like, you, yeah. you, you've got the pick of the litter. Totally. So... Quality of advice review. What are, what's your views on that big proposal? Um, the final submissions have been submitted. Uh, what are the things that you would like to see come out of that whole process and that review? Look, broadly speaking with the quality of advice, it, it is fundamentally going to change. It's My fear at the start was, is this going to be just a, you know, polishing and a little bit of a, this is not, this is a like rip all the band-aids off and make some fundamental changes to financial planning. I want to give Michelle Levy her due. 
she had the way she has engaged and gone around and spoken to everyone numerous times, like countless times, has been so impressive. This is not someone that says, "Sorry, here's our here's our findings. Take it or leave it." She's really wanted to engage really, really broadly. Now, that doesn't mean we're necessarily going to have to agree with everything she said, but I think if it was a scenario with take the whole package or take nothing, absolutely, you'd be grabbing and taking the whole package. Touche. And so there's a couple. Look, there's a couple of things in there that, in particular, you know. We're a bit iffy on in terms of, you know, I'll loosely call them the irrelevant providers, right? People providing advice who aren't financial advisors. Sure, yeah. And, and we, we understand that the challenge she's got, which is, I mentioned before, 16,000 advisors we can't service. That's right. And people might call up with a really, really basic question. And generally, they're probably not going to be our client at that stage anyway. Yes. But it's how deep does that go, right? Like, what, what, how far can they go? Like, how complex is the advice can they create? And so, that, that's a challenge that we're going to have to somehow force. I'm not for forces, not the wrong word, somehow deal with and, and put the, the guardrails in so that consumers aren't the ones harmed. Yes. But equally, maybe this is a way of, of the pipeline of the advisor of the future. And one of the things we're pushing for is, well, maybe those, the, you know, doing the simplest advice, they can get some simple quals, maybe get to two units, right? Like, yes. a, like nesting. So you, to get your grad dip now, it's eight units. So what if they had to do two of those eight units mm. to, to do that? Or now we've got a pipeline. I, I've done two of my eight. I can do basic stuff. I like this. I'll do more. Cool. Yes. Go and do eight units and become an advisor. And so maybe this is a great way of getting a pipeline of more people into the profession yep. as well. Because I like what you said, like good good advice is better than perfect advice or some advice is better than no advice. So where do you sit? Like not everything's going to be perfect, but what are, what are we comfortable with so that people can access some level of advice rather than no advice. And, and the potential for consumer detriment is really mm. important here. And we've already got that somewhat in our, in our regs. That's what she's ultimately to Yeah, right. we've got the small advice exemptions at the moment, you know, under ten or $15,000. We can give some simple advice without SOA. We there's, there's already there's see that in our current laws. And so, you know, she's obviously looking to expand that a lot further than just that. So we've yeah. already got that principle already. So there Good is this point, whole yep. point. And we have it like a medical, right? We can go and buy paracetamol. Sure. Because it's a chance yeah. of consuming. Now, as it just turned out, paracetamol is going the other way at the moment. But there are some things that we can do for ourselves because there's limited. So where's the paracetamol mm. and nurofen at the financial advice level? Good question. And where's the Schedule 6 narcotic yeah. that you really want your doctor prescribing, right? Yes. And so that's where we need to help, help frame that. So even if the quality of advice review isn't going to frame it, yes. we need to make sure that we're the ones then framing it and saying, well, no, we don't think that product provider should be able to go that detail. That's quite complex. Mm. I've got an existential question, actually, and it leans on everything you're talking about at the moment in terms of consumers. You, you, you've got consumer groups, right, such as Choice, and they, they will come out with, and they came out just this week or it was last week, it was recently, with some ideas around commissions. And, 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 and to me, it's not really so much whatever it is that they're coming up with, right? That, they're going to come up with things all the time. With, with, with emerging of the associations, with a, with a across the board improvement in the quality of advice and the quality of advisors and the new influx of, you know, uh, the education standards and all these things, here's a tough question. Do you see the association playing a role as, as an, as a unified advocacy group again? So, in, in terms of choice, whatever it is that they come out with, and then saying, actually, no. Because the issue has been, and you're very well aware of this, as, as everyone is, because of the function of financial planning, because there were things that there have been issues in the past, and yada, 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 there's always been a, well, we know we need to do this, but unfortunately, just due to everything else, we're unable to you know, put forward a unified, confident stance um, do you see that happening again with everything that's happened recently? Well, we've, you know, in terms of our advocacy, we've worked with, you know, there's a joint action working group, there's 12 groups have already come together. And with the AFA, we're already having a lot of joint submissions on a number of topics already. The thing is, if this merger goes ahead, there'll be one large dominant voice for financial advice, right? Mm, good. This is the lion's share, the majority of financial planners good. in this country. You're always going to have maybe the odd... And, and, and we're a broad church, right? If you... We, we asked our uh, members a, a question last this time last year around what are you thinking about, um, I think it was a relaxing of some of the education requirements. I can't quite remember what it was. But we had a, we had a wide ra- range of views. 70% were one direction, 30 the other. So we're never going to get perfect. Totally. But you're there to represent th- that broad membership. Absolutely. And when it comes to what Choice has got to say or other groups, where we agree with them, great. We'll, we'll, but where we disagree, 
We're, it's our job to prosecute our argument. Yes, that's that was kind of the question because I I haven't seen well, and and I guess advisors in general haven't felt like that has happened a lot. Now, of course, and I I will give the caveat is because maybe it wasn't always always the role of the association to defend some of those things. But I I, I think now that I think we've got a stronger leg to stand on, and and it, and it's good to hear what your response just then. Well, we are. Educated, yep. ethical, yep. experienced, yes. and examined. Yes. Right? The four E's. Yeah. We, we have basically from 2026, the hallmarks of a profession. For anyone listening who's done the ethics unit, uh, what was his name? Ernest Good, Good something, 1960, had the hallmarks of a profession. I still remember from my ethics mm. unit that I had to pass. Uh, Greenwood, Ernest Greenwood. Uh, you know, they were the hallmarks of a profession. We'll, we'll be there. Like, we can call yeah. ourselves a profession going forward. And and with that up, you know, lifting of professional standards across the board for everyone, yes, we now get the benefits of that, which is the trust that we can sit in front of a client, not go through 37 steps or 400 the steps or whatever it is, every, yeah. minutiae of saying, okay, you're not trusted to do it on your own. We actually have that trust. Now, mm-hmm. we've got we to guard that preciously ourselves as well, yeah. right, that we, don't, that we don't breach it. But we can now have, you know, a, convers- a client comes in with a simple request, we can give them a simple answer mm-hmm. rather than... A, I'll come back to you in three weeks because I've got to write a 16-page document, get a compliance check with my licensee, and then I'll come back to you. Mm. Oh, by the way, yeah, pay that money off your mortgage. Yes. <laughs> and as a follow-on to, to Clayton's question, and, and tell me if I'm well off, but you're much deeper into these conversations and sentiment than we are. But because there's been such a journey to get to that profession, there seems to be a, a trend or, or a bit of a sentiment that you don't, you don't want to go back to the Wild West, but almost that the simplicity and flexibility that Michelle is trying to, I guess, offer, it's almost because this has been so hard, I don't want to lean into that because I've gone through so much. And it's interesting to look at a future and try and bring things that have weighed you down as a, as a professional and because you've been fighting certain bad outcomes to take that into the future of, of, you know, of what that could be. I've mentioned this before. In a way, we're a little bit institutionalized mm. as advisors because we carry the scars of FSRA. We carry the scars of FOFA. Royal, like we carry that with us. And I mentioned before, that's what's so great about this emer- the emerging cohort. They don't have any of those scars. Mm. They're going to go, what, what do you... Why what are you, you doing that? Yeah. What do you mean? What's a you know, FOFA? Yeah. What's a... Yeah. <laughs> so, mm. I, I look at that and go, they're going to be the inspirations to take us forward. Mm. You know, um, that, look, licensees are going to be probably the hardest to shift because they're dealing with two, maybe 200, 300 different advisors. They're trying to set a setting for everyone. Yes. And I, I get the sense that maybe self-licensed businesses will then start taking the lead because it's, they, they can be more agile and move when it comes to, okay, let's say SOAs go as part of mm. uh, Michelle Levy. There's got to be nervousness about that, right? Yeah. Some people go, no, 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 no. What do you mean? No, I'm giving them an like SOA. And, and, and even if it's even if it's good, within five days, if it's a critical, I'm definitely like, people That's are going to so still be there. Do you know how long this process has taken yeah, me to build yeah, and yeah. refine and perfect and now they get it and I don't yeah. want to let it go because it's taken me so yeah. long. Yeah. Like you've just started, like that's what I was trying to explain. It's taken yeah. me so long to get here. Yeah. But could the future just be easier? Yep. Yeah. And so what you'll see is, and, I, and I've, I've said this, Michelle, said it's not going to change day one because advisors are so scared. Conservative. They're so worried about yes. breaching a rule, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And they all live, live in fear of that. Yes. And they're not, and there's more worried about that than actually, well, what's the end result of the, of the advice that we give? Yeah. I'm, like, I'm sort of yeah. stretching, no, 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 stretching the, the truth point. a little yes. bit there. But I think as soon as we get some of these changes, we'll get some early adopters, mm. right? Absolutely. And as soon as the early adopters go through and it all of a sudden goes, you know, it's a bit like when the, the buffalo crosses the river. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? I mean, admittedly, one or two of them end up getting done by the crocodile. But um, you, then you'll just see it absolutely... <laughs> it's very well fed crocodile. Yeah. <laughs> just don't be that one. Yeah, don't be that one. But you'll see a couple go through and then a couple more. And then all of a sudden, the herd will follow. Mm. And it won't take that long. And then we'll have a Congress like this and we'll have another birthday and we'll look back and go, do you remember when we had to do those 112-page documents? Yeah. Like, and we'll look back and, and we'll laugh about how ridiculous it was. <laughs> yeah. well, t- talking about the early adopters, Corey was um, giving all the work that the FPA has done a huge shout-out because he's now moved to video SOAs. And he's like, that's gone from eight hours to two hours. Wow. So there's people already pushing through and just so excited around what this future could be. I, I, I actually and how got a question. It could be. I got a question this morning on video SOAs. Why is the FBA prosecuting video SOAs if SOAs are going right? I said because you just get rid of the S and the O. It becomes video advice. <laughs> right? right? It's not a statement of advice. It's a video advice. And so, how good would it be? If a client's emailed you. You realise you can't get back to them. You pull out your iPhone. You record it and say, 
hey, um, yep, I know you've got that tax return. Your strategy was we wanted you to make a non-concessional to super. This is what we're going to do. It's four grand. Get it in and we'll send you the forms tomorrow. Bam, record, email it, file note, job done. And the advice is still pristine. Yep, because you know it's the client, right? It's been recorded. It's been understood. That is so good. That, the world, a world like that would be phenomenal. Then, now, if a client comes in and they go, look, I want to buy my commercial property. How can I do it? Oh, do you know what? You can set up a self-managed super fund. We might have to gear. Mm. Let me tell you, I'm not doing that in a three-minute phone call with a recording. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually going to spend a lot more time going Absolutely. through it because it's complex. Yes. And so, therefore, it's the same as when you go to the doctor and they go, yeah, you've kicked yeah, your toe. So- Put a Band-Aid on it. See you later. <laughs> yeah. They can do with it. You go in and you know what, you've had a bad result. We're going to have to spend a lot of time investigating going yes. through it. Fantastic Let analogy. Us, but we are the professions, professionals. Correct. Let us use our professional judgment. Yes. So when it's simple, yes. we can give you a simple result. Yes. And when it's complex, yes. I'm telling you now, I won't do an SOA, but I'll do something that it's documented yes. that they can walk away with. Absolutely. And I'm going to use my judgment as to when I use which. David, our 10-minute conversation has gone into a fabulous 22-minute conversation. I tend to waffle, so I apologise. No, you shared so many valuable insights and perspectives. So thank you for joining Clayton and I. We've really enjoyed this discussion. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. And what a fabulous congress. Thank you. Thank you.